here. My name is Will. We, uh, TMP is, it stands for the Meeting Place. You know, we are a prayer and training center, and our heart is to gather the hungry and broken to meet with God. And as they meet with God and as they're trained, we hope and believe that God will raise them up to become spiritual leaders to make an impact where they are. Can everyone say impact? Everyone say impact. Everyone say kingdom impact where they are. Help me out. Right? So that's our heart, that believers will be scattered. We won't just gather and build a big building and build a big ministry, but we will go on and actually make a difference wherever God has placed them. And over the last several months, uh, we've been going through a sermon series um, through the life of David. In fact, the meeting place was birthed out of Psalm 63, which was a prayer of David, where David said, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you. In this dry, it sounds like a love song, right? It's like, in this dry and weary land where there is no water, I have beheld your sanctuary. And we started the sermon series to try to understand what it was about David that made him so special. What it was about David that made him, that made God say, this is a man after my own heart. And tonight was supposed to be our fifth message on this. And I haven't done this in a long time. You know, last night at 9 p.m., I was at my office and I just sat down. And I was like, God, I'm just going to pray. And you should never pray this unless you really are going Unless you're really open to God just messing your plans up, okay? Um, I just sat down and I said, God, we got TMP tomorrow. Have your way. Whatever I prepared, whatever I planned, I did it on to you. But if that's not what you want, I'll just scrap it all. And when I said that, I, felt, I had nine pages of notes from my former sermon. Nine pages. You know, it's, like a, it's like a research paper when you're like, in, like a freshman year in college or something, right? And right when I said that, I fell in my heart. God was like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted you to pray. You are not going to preach on 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 10 about David and Saul and David and Jonathan and Saul's jealousy. And I have a new message for you. And I said to you, I said, the devil is a liar. And I just, you know, I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit starts like speaking to you like, no, 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 that's not me. That's not me. I just sat down and I said, God, it's 9 p.m. I got to go home. My baby, I got to be there for Andrea. That's fine. I'm just going to sit down. And all of a sudden, a passage came on my heart, and it was from Genesis chapter 13. And as I, I opened it, I said, God, it's, it's better be you, man. You know, you, you don't, you're not supposed to do this on the norm, okay? I don't do this all the time. I haven't done this a single time in the last year and a half, us gathering like this. But I felt in my heart that God wanted me to talk about pursuing his assignment for your life. Pursuing his assignment for your life. Right? I was going to talk about David and Jonathan's friendship for the glory of God and how Jonathan resembles us to Jesus, how he said my soul was knit to him. But all of a sudden, I felt so strongly in my heart as I was reflecting on 2018 to remind you and tell you that God has an assignment on your life for the glory of his name and for the joy of his people. The Bible is so clear all throughout scriptures from Genesis to Revelation that when God created you, he had an assignment and a purpose for you to fulfill, not only to be saved, not only to come to church, but for something for you to do for the glory of his name and for his kingdom. It's all throughout scriptures, right? Joseph had an assignment to be prime minister. Moses had an assignment to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. And Joshua had an assignment to take them into the land of Canaan. Deborah had an assignment to be a prophetic voice to Israel during a time when they're in military strategy and chaos. Mary had an assignment to give birth to the Messiah. All throughout scriptures, it's clear there is no coincidence, but God has custom designed, distinct and unique. Everyone say assignments. Assignment. Look at your neighbor and say assignment and an assignment for your life. Some of you guys are thinking, no, he have a, he, you know, God has an assignment for my brother. God has an assignment for that pastor. God has an assignment for my coworker. God has an assignment for this individual. No, no, no. The Bible is very clear that God is not a respecter of people. God has an assignment for you to fulfill. And Genesis 13 popped out to me, and I want to get a mid-snapshot of Abraham pursuing his assignment from God. Not the beginning when he received the assignment and not at the end of his life when he fulfilled his assignment, but a mid-snapshot of his process of trying to fulfill the things that God had called him to do. 
And we're going to look at, I'm going to say Abraham, but before Genesis, during Genesis 13, his name is Abram. But later in chapter 17, when he encounters God, his name changes to Abraham. That is a sermon in itself. Why? Because when you encounter God, your life changes. So I'm just going to say Abraham, but in the Bible, it talks to him as Abram. So I'm going to give you some background. Genesis chapter 12, God has called Abram out of his father's house, out of his country, to leave his kindred, and then to go to a land that God was going to show him. And he also promises that you will be as numerous, your, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. So Abraham received an assignment from God, Abraham, I want you to leave your father's house. I want you to leave the country that you were born in. And I also want you to leave your kindred. And that's how Genesis 12 starts. And in Genesis 12, Abraham actually leaves. He obeys the Lord. He obeys the voice of God. He obeys God's assignment. He leaves his father's house. He leaves his country. But there's one thing he doesn't do. He doesn't leave his kindred. Everyone say kindred. That means your relatives and your cousins and all that stuff. During Thanksgiving, y'all met up with all your cousins and uncles and aunts. Maybe some of you, you're, this is not home, so you're by yourself. But during the family time, right, you're usually with different relatives and cousins. He takes Lot with him. Lot was his nephew. Lot was the son of his brother, Haram. And all of a sudden, instead of obeying God completely, he obeys God partially. And then in Genesis 13, this is what happens. Tension arises between Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen, because they are wealthy and rich. Abraham has too many sheep and cattle and flock, and Lot now also has too many sheep and cattle and flock and too many people, and they begin to fight. In Genesis 12, earlier before this, as Abraham is going through Egypt, the Pharaoh blesses Abraham with a whole bunch of cattle. And the reason why tension arises is this, is because there wasn't enough land there wasn't enough resources and water and food for all of Abraham's cattle and Lot's cattle to feed. So all of a sudden, as Abraham is pursuing God's assignment for his life, tension rises where Lot and Abraham have to separate. Hear me, this is my first point. When you begin to follow God's assignment for your life, eventually there will come a time when you can no longer walk with who you used to walk with. When you're following God's calling on your life, when you're following God's will for your life, when you're following God's assignment for your life, eventually as you are following God, you will realize I cannot get to where he wants me to go with the same people that I've been with in the past. And all of a sudden, when that begins to happen, this is actually hard for some people, especially loyal people. Loyal people have an incredibly difficult time moving on to the next assignment that God has because they love the people that they were with. They love the people that they did life with. They love the people that they did service with. They love the church community that they were with. They love the people they worked with at the office. But when God begins to call you, the closer you get to the assignment, the past has to leave and stay behind you. Check this out. In Genesis chapter 13, this is what it says right here in verse 5 through 9. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot, Lot's livestock. And at that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. That's just to show there's even more people than their people. So the land was getting too populated. And then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. At this point, it's a critical juncture. Abraham has says, I cannot be with who I used to be. I cannot walk with who I used to walk. I cannot run with who I used to run with. I just fell on my heart today as I was preparing. There's some of you this year, 2018, 
You were beating yourself up and you were discouraged because you knew that God had a new assignment for you. But when you looked at the people you had been with, you didn't want to leave them. When you looked at the people that you have run with, you didn't want to leave them. When you have those memories of the things that you've done over the years, but all of a sudden in your heart and in your gut, you know that you know that God is calling. And that is what Abraham is feeling. Now, let me say this. This is not an excuse to say, I hate my job. I'm getting a better job. This is not an excuse to say, my church sucks, so I'm going to find another church. In fact, when this happens, it usually happens when you don't want to leave. You know it's God when you don't want to leave. You want to stay. You feel like you just fell in love with this community. You feel like you just fell in love with this church. You feel like you just got to understand this complicated girl that you were dating, but now God says, no, no, because you have a calling on your life. You have an assignment on your life, and you have to move on. Because some of y'all will hear this and say, that's right, I'm quitting my job and getting a better job tomorrow. That's right, I'm leaving my church. My small group leader sucks. I'm getting a better. That's not how this works. When God moves the people that were once with you, it's because that jar has been full and God wants to give you a new jar and a bigger jar for you. Not for you, not for your opportunities and your desires, but for God's assignment for your life. You know, a few years ago, I was talking to a guy uh, at my church several years ago. We had an incident where the congregation that was once there left to start their own church. It's not a bad thing to happen sometimes, and they left. And among those people that left, one of them I was pretty close to, and he calls me and says, hey, Pastor Will, but this is when I used to be a junior high pastor. He said, yo, Pastor Will, can I talk to you when you're free? Absolutely. We sat down, and we go into a room at church. The door is closed. I miss those days, man, when you used to just be at church, just pouring into people's lives. Anyways, but he's sitting down with me, and he says, you know, Pastor Will, you know how everyone's leaving? He's like, I don't know what to do. I said, all right, just share with me. He said, that's my family. And he said, and that pastor, he's like my spiritual father. And he looks at me and says, I am torn. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. And I looked at him. I said, well, what do you think God is telling you to do? This is what he did. I said, what's wrong? He's like, I love them so much but I feel in my heart I'm supposed to stay. And he did, by the time his, his head was down, he was crying. He's, he's a man. He's not a kid. He was an adult. You know, I was like, oh, you know, it just, just kind of felt weird between me and him. But the funny thing is, you know what's funny? I started crying. He didn't know because his head was down the whole time. I started crying too because I knew exactly how he felt. I've had moments in my life when I was like, God is calling me to move this way. And as I turn around, people behind me are saying, you betrayed me. You left me. Us. You wait. Oh, here, here it goes. You ain't the same. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Especially those of us who kind of grew up in the streets. There's this like culture, yo, through <laughs> thick and thin we ride. I remember when I was trying to follow Christ, all my friends were smoking weed, doing yay and partying it up. I was like, I got to follow the Lord. They're like, you changed. I said, yes, I did. You need to change too. You know what I'm saying? And I remember when I became a youth pastor and I became a college pastor, five years, I loved my church. In fact, I remember when I was a college pastor and I was walking on the streets. I used to walk around because I was so anxious before I preached, just walking, walking. I said, God, may this be my first church and my last church. How naive. <laughs> and I, was, I thought God was like, amen, nope. A year later, God was like, it's time for you to move on. Why am I saying this? I feel like there's some of you, you're burdened And you're beating yourself up because the people that you left behind, but you didn't leave them, God is moving you. This year, before you go into 2019, you got to give it to God. You might see them and feel guilty. You might see them and feel a little bit of pressure. You might see them and feel like, oh, did I do this? Did I do that? You might even think, did I make a mistake? But when God calls you to move towards his assignment, there will come chapters in your life as these people have to go in order for you to fulfill. When God told Abraham, you must leave everyone, it's because God had a special assignment for him and Lot played his part for that time. But once that was fulfilled, he had to move forward. Pursue God's assignment and don't get stuck in those relationships. This is weird to say because I'm a loyal person. And it's hard to say this 
But when I said, you don't leave because you want to, you leave when you know God has called you to. And as Abraham is doing this, this is the part that really moved my heart to go into this passage as we close 2018. Here we go. As you are pursuing your God-given assignment or assignments, here we go, you have to surrender the outcome into the hands of God. Some of you are like, this is what God told me. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care. Whenever someone, whenever, when anyone ever says to me, this is what God told me, I'm going to do it no matter what. I'm like, bro, what if you're wrong? <laughs> what if you just hate that person? <laughs> what if you're just thinking things? So, no, God, no, whenever God leads you and guides you, you have to lead the outcome into the hands of God. You know why this passage really moved me? Think about this. His assignment was land, the land of Canaan. His assignment was new land and new territory that God wanted to send them to. But you know what God tells Lot? Hey, we're getting too big. We have to separate. You choose whatever land you want. I will take whatever you don't choose. This blew my mind away. If I was Abraham and I knew my assignment was a specific land, I would have been, all right, fine. Hey, I'm going here, you go there. What does this show us? This shows us as Abraham is following the will of God and the, and the purposes and his assignment, he says, I trust God. He's saying, I know God promised me land, so if I go left or if I go right, all of this land belongs to God. What is he saying? If I have this job or if I have that job, the kingdom of God is going with me. Oh, come on, somebody. God promised Abraham land. He didn't promise the land, Abraham. <laughs> and all that to say the promises and the assignments in your life are going to come about no matter what. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on. I know you're a control freak like me. I know you're trying to make sure everything goes the way you planned it. But no, when it comes to the assignment of God, Abraham says, look, God promised me land. But you choose whatever land you want, and I'll go whatever direction that you don't decide to go. This is showing us that Abraham trusts in God. He trusts in God's power. He trusts in God's sovereignty and God's goodness. And this is what is fascinating, and this is another point I want to talk about. Did you know there's a difference between man-made opportunities and God-given assignments? I didn't know this before. Man-made opportunities is when you are looking to promote yourself. Man-made opportunities is when you are trying to promote your agenda, your desires, your dreams, your ambitions. God-given assignments promotes the glory of God. It promotes the agenda of God. It promotes the kingdom of God. Why am I saying this? Lot is a perfect example for someone that looked for a man-made opportunity. Abraham looked for the glory of God and his God-given assignment. Look at this right here in verses 10 to 15. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journey east. Thus they separated from each other. Abraham let him choose. You want this or that? Then Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Now this is a fascinating part because verse 14 is a contrast to verse 10. It says, Lot lifted his eyes towards Gomorrah. He lifted his eyes towards Zor. But in verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring. Do you see this right here? 
Lot was looking for the best possible job he could get. Lot was looking for the highest income. Lot was looking for the best opportunity for him to promote himself. Lot was looking for a land that looked wealthy and rich. And he would say, oh, he just starts calculating. He starts to manipulate in his mind. He started to say, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. If I go here, I'm going to get this promotion, I'm going to get that promotion. Here's my point. Christians are not called to be successful per se. I know a lot, a lot of times, especially in our generation, we mix Christianity with American culture. So you see a lot of Christians say, God wants you to be rich. What? Our Savior was poor. Other people say, God wants you to have a promotion. Jesus' promotion was being exalted on the cross. <laughs> People are like, oh, God wants you to, no, 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 no. You know what God wants you to do? God just wants you to obey him. And if that obedience leads to riches, praise God. If that obedience leads to poverty, praise God. That's why Apostle Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Whether high or low, well-fed or hungry, naked or clothed, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Come on, somebody. And I know many of us at this age are going towards man-made opportunities. We're going towards the next big job. We're going towards the next big promotion. Now, if God is leading you that way, go for it. That's how he led Joseph. That's how he led David. But for Abraham at this point, he was like, I'll just go wherever you tell me why. Because his heart was bent towards God-given assignments. Your goal in life is not to be successful. Businessmen and businesswomen, your goal in life is not to make a lot of money. Entertainers, actors, and musicians, the goal of your life is not to make some amazing TV show or a hit song. No, the goal of your life is to obey the will of God for your life. Whether you are successful in the eyes of the world or not is not important. Not important. It's really not. You know, I was talking to my wife, and I said, honey, was there, I had an insistence, but I said, honey, was there a time where we kind of experienced this? She said, oh, yeah, I remember. Um, this happened to me when I was like 24 or something. I forget the age, but you know, I was a college pastor at a church, thriving and doing so well. And I just, I, I, at that time, it was turmoil. It was, it was turbulent. But I sensed God saying, you got to go. Man, that was not easy, but I left. And as I was leaving, there was like a three-month uh, limbo time where I didn't know what I was supposed to do next. I wasn't sure what God had for me and what God had in store for me. But my heart's prayer was just, God, help me do what you want. Help me do what you want. And I've had some phone calls for some great churches, great opportunities. And by the way, pastors struggle with this too. Come on now. God's, God hasn't called all pastors to have big ministries. <laughs> Oh, that's, oh, no, I got real quiet. Like, what? <laughs> you know, I remember, I think it was Daniel. My boy Daniel right here, he's a dentist. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, I should have asked you. This just came totally curveball. He was debating if he should go into dental school or be a pastor. And I remember we were wrestling and wrestling. And one of uh, a prayer warrior asked him, Daniel, if God told you to go to Africa as a missionary and just minister to one person for the rest of your life, will you do it? He said, nah. <laughs> He's like, you're not called. Go to dentistry, right? So, <laughs> right? No, really. Like, what if, what if God calls you to just steward just one Samuel? You know, Hannah's assignment was just to raise Samuel in the ways of the Lord. That was her whole assignment. You know, I look at my wife lately, and I'm saying, honey, this is the biggest assignment of your life. Feed that girl. Come on, somebody. <laughs> My wife and I are sitting down, and my wife's like, man, I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm like, honey, me too. I want to do this. And as we're talking about our dreams, you hear, nah. <laughs> and we're like, oh, just let her cry. <laughs> Give it five minutes. Nah. Like, yeah. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, that's my assignment, to love this girl, to steward this girl, to care for this girl. Don't think assignment means big. Just do whatever God had told you to do and leave the outcome into the hands of God. And this is what happened. I was at this church, and big opportunities came my way. And I was like, yeah, I'm a somebody. You know, like, you start feeling like, oh, they called me? It's just like for me as a pastor. For you, it'd be like if Google called you and said, hey, we want to hire you. 
You know, you know, guess who called me? Google, Facebook. Oh my, right, you've, and all of a sudden I was praying about this and I was just praying with my wife and I was, okay, I'm probably gonna go here. And then I got invited to speak at a VBS with first or fifth graders. And I was like, oh yeah, this is just a side thing. And I preached, and it was crazy, yo. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit broke. It was like 500 elementary kids. It was the craziest thing I've ever experienced in my life. I did an altar call, and most people stopped in the front. They all came on stage, and they were grabbing my shirt. They were like grabbing the sound, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, church. I didn't know. And then the pastor grabs me after and says, hey, pastor, we heard you're in transition. What's going on? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm not looking for any you know, ministry assignments or any churches. I'm just going to rest. But in my heart, I, I was thinking about going to this big church in Chicago. And I was like, all right. And all of a sudden, they said, oh, we were wondering if you'd be willing to come be a pastor at our junior high. And I was like, junior high. <laughs> well, I'm just being honest. Because I was college, you know, I was adult, pastoring young adults, the hip and cool. I said, junior high. And this is what they said. You don't have to answer. This is, this is the worst thing they could have said to me. They said, just pray about it. <laughs> Devil is a liar. I should have been like, so I rebuked that in Jesus' name. They said, just pray about it. Remember I went home, I just started praying. I said, honey, let's just visit on their Friday night. There's not even time, let's just go. And I remember I went in and I was looking, there's like the windows were like those doors right there, the little cracks like this. I looked in and I see like 12 junior high kids running around. <laughs> You could just feel puberty was all in the room. Like they were confused. Their voices were cracking everywhere. They looked just so awkward. Junior high is the most awkward stage. Right? They're just weird, right? And all of a sudden, I'm looking at these kids and my heart starts going for them. And I was like, stop. <laughs> Come back, heart. You know, it was like, I look at this kid running around. I'm like, oh, I want to pastor him. And then I saw the staff. There was like four or five staff there because they had no pastor for like a month or two. And they were kind of like running around. And I saw them and I was like, all right, honey, let's go. And I went home and I started praying. I just started crying. See, if I was seeking man-made opportunities, I would have, reason would have told me, the logic in the world and success would have told me, go to Chicago, build your resume, and build that platform. But when you are obeying the voice of God, almost always, he tells you to do what you least expect. Come on now. It's like you're, it's like the least expected thing he would tell you at times. But when you are following your God-given assignment, hear me when I say this. It's so important that you know this. Because when you know that God has an assignment for you, you don't look at other people's assignments and compare yourself because that's not your assignment. When you know that God has a calling for you, you don't look at other ministers and see what they're doing because you're not called to do what they're doing. When you look at other occupations and other people in your office who seem to be doing better, but if you know that's not my assignment, this is my assignment, it will give you security and peace to focus on the things that God wants you to focus on. Too many of you are in your assignment but looking at somewhere else. God has called you to bring the fragrance of God's kingdom in your office, but you're looking at the office across the street. God has called you to pastor these junior high kids, but you're looking at your future church plants. God has called you to love your family, but you're looking at your own future family. Why? Most people are looking for man-made opportunities, and that's what Lot was doing. But Abraham said, I don't care what land I go to, because all this land belongs to God. Um, this is my last point. I only had one night. <laughs> this is 9 p.m. last night. We're going to pray. As you are pursuing God's assignment for your life, hear me, hear me. This is the word. You have to repeatedly build altars throughout your journey. As you are pursuing your God-given assignment, you have to repeatedly build altars to seek the face and voice of God. Let me tell you something. What God told you yesterday is not going to take you to where God wants you to go tomorrow. Let me tell you something. What God told you when you first became a Christian is not going to sustain you where you got to go tomorrow. Many people are living off of yesterday's direction. Can you imagine if Abraham lived off of what God told him before? He would have been stuck in Egypt. God said, go, I'm in Egypt. Oh, I heard from God. I'm going to stay here forever. No. As you're pursuing your journey, you got to build altars repeatedly. 
over and over and over, constantly. Verse 4, so Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with them into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in his livestock in silver and in gold, and he journeyed on from Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Here it is, verse 4. To the place where he had made an altar at first. And there Abram, let's read this part all together, one, two, three. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. I'm going to read actually a few more verses for you. Genesis 12, 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So there he built an altar to the Lord. Genesis 12, 8. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of the Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. Hear this. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Let's go again. Genesis 13, 18. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Come on, somebody. Abraham's relationship with God was constant and living. He could have said, you know what, I'm going to build an altar just in Haran or Hebron. I'm going to build an altar just in Egypt. I'm going to build an altar just in Canaan. No, as he was pursuing his assignment, he kept building altars. What is an altar? This is before the Mosaic Law. In the Mosaic Law, the altar was where you offered up sacrificial sin atonement offerings. So you brought atonement, you brought animals to appease for your sins, or you brought animals to give it to God as a thankful offering. That's what an altar is. And or, because it's before the Mosaic Law, what we see from this passage I was researching, this altar was unique because it says he built an altar and there he called upon the name of the Lord. In other words... This altar was a place where he cried out to God. This is fascinating because this is not your typical spiritual discipline of prayer. He's not just praying. Because we all pray. We pray before we eat. We pray before we sleep. We pray when we're running from the cops. Come on, somebody. We pray for all different reasons, right? We pray before we have a final. I I used to have revival services when I was running from the cops. I'm like, before I was a Christian. Anyways, right, so... We all pray, but you know what this is specifically talking about? This is not talking about just spiritual discipline or prayer. This is talking about specific incidents in his life that forced him to call out to God. This is talking about specific seasons in his life where he had to say, God, I need you. In fact, in the word here in Hebrew, it's better translated to cry out to God. This is what some commentator said to me, uh, not said to me, I read online. (laughs) All Christians have at some point prayed to God. God hears these prayers, whether they're silent, quiet, or loud. But the practice of calling out to God, which is a form of prayer, is definitely audible. In the Bible, the Hebrew word for call means to call out, to cry out, And in the Greek, the word means to invoke a person and to call out by name. By crying out to the Lord, we're saying we're hungry. We're saying we need him. And we're saying we can't make it without him. Look, some of y'all right now, you need to cry out to God. You're at a critical juncture in your life as you're pursuing God and you're about to make this weird thing. You gotta cry out to God. This is not just praying, oh, Father God, thank you. This is a, a, an environment pressured force where it's, I don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know you called me. I know you assigned me. I know you want to use me for your honor and for your name. This is what TMP is about. This is not a church, per se, where we gather. and No, this is a place for hungry and broken people seeking God. 
And as I come to a close, I want to say this. Jesus also had an assignment. And his assignment was to actually go on that altar. Jesus had an assignment. His assignment progressed as time went on. Yes, for a season he was a carpenter. But his ultimate assignment was to die on that altar. Did you know the last altar that Abraham builds is in Genesis 22 in Mount Moriah where he was supposed to sacrifice his son? That's the last altar. Because at that time in Mesopotamia, it was normal for ancient uh, religions around that time to sacrifice their kids. So when Abraham heard that, he said, okay, everyone else is doing it, I'm going to do it too. But our God is different. He sacrifices his son, so we don't need to sacrifice our lives. And when Jesus comes, he had an assignment, and that assignment was to save you. That assignment was to love you. That assignment was to give you access to his glory so that you can have a relationship with him. Let me say this as we close. As Jesus went to the altar and died on that cross, because he wanted you. Look, your assignment from God, the key to that is to have a relationship with Christ first. I was living, I was living up. I was young, but I was living it up and I was going my way, my life, my style, my everything. But when Jesus said, I died for you and his assignment was to die on the cross for the glory of God and the salvation of all people, you have a choice today. If you're a non-believer or if you're far from God, what's most important is I want to know Jesus. I want to walk with Jesus. Before we go into a time of prayer, and and tonight I think I'm going to open the altar to pray for people who you just got to pray for. You know, this this, this sermon was even confirmed because on Sunday I went to church and the first thing the pastor said was, I want to preach on rest and assignment. It's like, whoa, he just... God just confirmed what I was supposed to speak on. But before we go into prayer time and altar time, I want you guys to close your eyes.